It's no secret that I've been away from WoW for the past few months. Obviously, you can see the evidence for that in the fact that I've not made a new episode of the show since May. And while a large chunk of that stems from the fact that we just moved to a new city and are still in the process of trying to buy a new house, there's a larger problem. A massive problem. The biggest problem imaginable, at least for someone who creates WoW content. I've been burned out on WoW. I know. Shocking. I think burnout happens to all of us with this game once we've played long enough. It doesn't help that the highs of Dragonflight's launch immediately felt like it fell to the lowest of lows. And don't get me wrong, I think Dragonflight is a step in the right direction and is far better than any expansion since Legion. But it's still rife with problems that make it hard to keep going if you're not the type to min-max your characters to the extreme. Which I did. In fact, I have more max level characters right now than I ever have at any time in playing WoW. And if we're being honest, the story hooks haven't been there to keep me locked in. So much of the story is locked behind renown levels and systems and factions, and much like I typically do, I think I'd rather just wait until the near final patch of this expansion and then fast track all of that stuff so I can see it all at once. At least until this new rumored pirate expansion or boat expansion. Who knows? Give me a boat. I'll drive a boat. Sail a boat. I guess you don't drive boats. Anyways, what have I been doing in the meantime? Lately, it's been doing something I swore I wouldn't do again. I've been playing WoW Classic, but on a hardcore server. Yes. Launched uh, this past month as an official mode, the hardcore servers offer a simple, brutal, and tantalizing proposition. How far can you get in the OG version of the game when your tune has yet one life to live? The mode is not for everyone, as a member of my gaming group keeps insisting, and that's fine. I get it. There's a type of masochism involved, especially since we all know that death in OG WoW was not always fair or your fault. Disconnects, hyperspawns, any and all caves, other players, just about everything is a potential death trap. But I think that's also what I kind of love about it. The classic hardcore server is a real test of game knowledge, plotting, carefulness, strategy, and cooperation. Honestly, I haven't been this excited to play WoW since the Dragonflight launch, even as I lost my first hardcore character, a level 17 priest, just a little bit ago to a murloc. I, d I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> this dive back into the basics of WoW has also somewhat revived new questions about the lore that I kind of forgot I had. And if, I've ha if we've been so focused on the Burning Crusade lately, ignoring the last few months, that it was easy to forget that it's the macro level things about the game's lore that get me the most interested and not the big overarching points. And this includes a very important and era-defining faction that we're talking about today, the Scarlet Crusade. Whether you were Alliance or Horde in WoW, Classic or OG WoW, you were bound to run up against these red and white cloaked bigots at some point or another. While far more of a Horde enemy, even Alliance players were not spared the Crusade's wrath if they ventured into a quiet monastery found near the former capital of Lordaeron. In my case, I was reminded of the Crusade's brutality upon having my second hardcore character, a Forsaken Warrior, killed almost immediately upon leaving the starting area, jumped by multiple Scarlet Crusade mobs. And one thing that struck me as my character was dying, my Forsaken couldn't understand what the Crusader enemies were shouting. It came out as the same gibberish, broken language it would as if I'd been facing a Night Elf or another enemy faction. and. I realize this is a foible of the old game, an inability to communicate with an enemy faction, but still, it was just hilarious that this Forsaken, the literal former denizen of Lordaeron, suddenly couldn't speak to or communicate with humans. Humans they may have even actually known in real life. So it goes. From this one silly question I had about gameplay decisions affecting lore, I was back in. And writing. So it goes. 
And that's why today on Essence of Azeroth, we're going to talk about the Scarlet Crusade, its history, fanaticism, and an example of why deplatforming works. How did the Crusade go from faction powerhouse to footnote and QAnon-like joke in universe? We're going to find out. This is Essence of Azeroth. And today's episode is brought to you by anyone who has subscribed to the show in the past year, as your support has always and will always be valued. If you want to help support the show and help guilt me into making more episodes, then go check out our Patreon over at patreon.com forward slash essence of Azeroth. As you'll soon find out in the eventual Sunwell episode, because that is still happening, my wife is a huge Star Wars fan, which is why I think we both do a really good job at talking about our respected fantasy universes without being super knowledgeable about the other's obsession. On one of our first dates, Rachel spent close to an hour explaining the Star Wars extended universe of books all launching off me merely finding a book under her bed and saying, oh, cool, I didn't know they did Star Wars books. Silly me. (laughs) However, there are actually a lot of similarities between the galaxy far, far away and our world of Warcraft. Factions of heroes all trying to do the right thing against fascist empires, multiple races and species of folks coming together for common issues, and a weird urge on the part of the fan bases to stand the most problematic bad guys. For Christmas one year, I got Rachel a Star Wars themed dress, which came out around the time of the first new movie of the newest trilogy hit. The dress itself was First Order themed, which is the evil faction that follows the remnants of the Empire. At the time, I remember thinking to myself that it's so weird that iconography, merchandising, and almost celebration of the evil galactic empire is so common among Star Wars fans. While everyone enjoys a good villain, including myself, it's still strange to see merch for the evil faction of the most iconic sci-fi fantasy universe of all time, and to see it offered up with such neutrality. Hey, do you want to wear the symbol of the evil space dictators that blow up planets and slave millions of free races, use shady backroom government tactics to keep down honest people, and whose leader is an elderly, power-hungry ideologue? Great, sign me up. (laughs) And in a similar way, the Scarlet Crusade sort of fills that role in WoW, at least on the meta level. For the longest time in World of Warcraft, the most sought-after cosmetic items in the game were two things either the Defias face mask for the rogue, or the full Scarlet Crusade set including the tabard and shield. Up until transmogs were introduced, you could still sell both for a tidy sum. In the case of the Scarlet Crusade armor, it's just funny on both an in-universe level and a meta level. Like, how does any of the races of Azeroth feel about seeing someone not in the Scarlet Crusade just running around rocking the colors and emblem? Oh, well, you see, it's it's about heritage, not hate. It's just a symbol. Right. In my head, I just imagine a raid getting ready to tackle a massive boss, and when the leader asks if anyone has any questions before beginning the siege, a forsaken party member just raises his hand, uh, the hand is not falling off, and goes, Uh, hey, are we not going to talk about how Steve over there is wearing a Scarlet Crusade tabard? They killed my entire family, set my former farm on fire, and ate my dog. And Steve's just like, Man, can we, like, not? That's so old news. My dad was a Scarlet Crusade member. It's just about heritage. Ugh. And on the meta level, it's kind of like the first order dress I bought my wife, unaware that it had the emblems and iconography of the Empire all over it, including right on the butt. Like... There's a dude at the Dark Moon Fair that sells the full Scarlet Crusader set now, so if that's your go-to transmog, then at best you're saying it looks cool and don't care what it represents, and at worst you're saying that it very much represents what you think it does, which we will get to in later. And yeah, this might be placing too much thought into a video game universe, but this is also what critical analysis is. In fairness to the situation, the Scarlet Crusade stuff is a holdover from a different time and place and era in WoW history. 
But on the other hand, its inclusion feels somewhat akin to if Call of Duty let you deck out any of your online characters in swastikas. Which, I, I mean that does happen, but usually not with the support of the company itself. But is that who the Scarlet Crusade is? If we take the lore-based look on how they look on paper, I suppose you could take them seriously. However, the more realistic take on the Crusade is that they're a bunch of disenfranchised white dudes, betrayed by royalty, suckered into fealty by both more royalty and then demons, and pretty much used as patsies for the entirety of their existence. So far do the Scarlet Crusade fall that by the time a battle for Azeroth rolls around, all that's left of the Crusade are some babbling idiots leaving propaganda pamphlets around human cities, spouting nonsense about how Anduin Wynn is secretly married to Sylvanas Windrunner as part of a plot to raise the heir to the former Lord Ron throne, Calumenethil, make her his undead bride, kill her again, and become the one true king of the former human nations. And I did not make any of that up. And guess what? That's QAnon shit. We're steps away from Scarlet Crusaders saying that Arthas is still alive and he's been reincarnated and will return for his throne any day now. Am I suppose this is a fitting in for a hate group, but it doesn't explain fully how the remnants of the Order of the Silver Hand went from dedicated warriors of the light to a handful of conspiracy theory shouting imbeciles. So, let's look at that. And good news, it has absolutely nothing to do with the Titans for once. So, I lied. This story does kind of start with the Titans. Welcome back to Essence of Azeroth. And by that, I mean we have to work backwards from the Scarlet Crusade and ask... Who benefits? And who are they? Let's cover the timeline first. The Scarlet Crusade, in World of Warcraft, was an enemy faction for both Alliance and Horde, made up of purely human race mobs, found in a variety of places, but their classes were most often either mages, warriors, paladins, or priests. That last one is important in regards to paladins because the origins of the Crusade begins with the end of another order, the Silver Hand, who we have talked about before. You could argue when the actual end of the Silver Hand is for the sake of being pedantic, whether it's the culling of Stratholm where Arthas marched his brothers into a soon-to-be-plagued city and began, began killing scores of still-alive humans who were carrying the zombie plague. But that was more of the spiritual end. The real end comes with the murder of Uther Lightbringer, Arthas plunging his sword into his former master, corrupting his soul, and then running off to Northrend towards his destiny. However, it's important to mention the political ramifications of the Silver Hand up to this point. It was comprised of army positions with prestige, really. One part reverend, another part special forces, this would have been where the wealthy elite and landowners of Lordron would have set up their Nepo baby children with cushy gigs. This isn't true for everyone, as evidenced by Arthas' own training and Uther's particularly stern hand, but if there was a place where the wimpy yet powerful children of the very racist elite would go, then it was probably with the Order of the Silver Hand. And racist they were. We've talked before about how Lordron, in the days long after the Troll Wars, became fat, happy, and suspicious of a suddenly burgeoning world. Night Elves, Gnomes, Dwarves, High Elves, and those were just the friendly races. It caused a ton of strife within the dark circles of power in the human world, and as we know from the end of Black segregation and civil rights in our own world, when the balance of power is threatened and you try to make everyone equal on terms in which they weren't equal before, it tends to make the worst of the worst do terrible things. And so, during the Third War, when the heroes of Azeroth fought on top of Mount Hyjal against the Burning Legion threat, another regiment joined together to formulate a plan. By this point, the Scourge Flood had wiped itself over the Eastern Kingdoms, distraught over the loss of their leader Arthas, and no longer feeling like they held any power, a congregation of the Silver Hand led by High General Abendus and High Lord Alexandros Mograin met in South Shore to combine, confer, and to channel a holy power to take back Lordron and show their strength over the so-called lesser races. 
This power came from a dark crystal recovered by Mograine during the Second War during a siege on Blackrock Spire, which came after the death of Anduin Lothar. This crystal found on the body of an orc warlock would form the core of a holy weapon unlike any other, a sword that could render flesh into ash with its own power. And if you want the full story on the Ashbringer, then I highly recommend the comic of the same name, as it really fills in that story of the Second War, the formation of the Ashbringer, and how the holy weapon falls to corruption once more. Honestly, that's probably a whole episode in and of itself. For now, all you need to know is that this jaded contingent of the Silver Hand now had this big purified artifact. Now they needed a cause, and it was decided to right their biggest wrong, take back Stratholm from the Unholy Nightmare. And that's when things went from racist to worst. But s still pretty racist. The culling and aftermath of Stratholm is one of the most significant moments in WoW's history. One of the former major human strongholds, and essentially considered to be the second capital of the Eastern Kingdoms, it stood as a continual glowing billboard highlighting the atrocities committed by Arthas and his army. And I think that's what is important to highlight here, is that the culling of Stratholm was a total example of groupthink and hive mind taking over, with nobody willing to go against the orders of a beloved leader. But what was done was done, and after the deaths of King Tyrannus and Uther, the leftover paladins of the mostly broken Silver Hand needed a mission. This core of the Order was led by one of their original five leaders. The Paladin Sidan D Dathrahan, a human born and raised in Lordran. Sidan was commissioned by Archbishop Alonzus Fael himself as one of the prime members of the Silver Hand. And so, the only one left, he and his men were faced with a decision. Chase Arthas and punish him for his crimes, or begin to take back their kingdom from the Undead Plague. They opted for assaults on Anderhal and Stratholm. However, you could argue that this is where things go from bad to worse. You see, racism and human elitism was nothing new in the Eastern Kingdoms, and honestly, it's a reoccurring theme throughout the species' history, even dating back to being malformed Vrykul and were left to die and then taken pity upon. However, humanity has always had that chip on their shoulder having to learn magic from the High Elves, relying on the dwarves to secure their own borders, and now surrounded on all sides, it's no shock that the humans with the worst intentions and ideals were the ones now carrying the banner for what remained of Lord Ron's army. And yet, it got worse once Sidan went into Stratholm and turned up missing. When he finally returned, it wasn't as he was. Now, let's talk about Dreadlords for a moment. We've mentioned them at various times throughout the series, and while it would be easy to boil them down as demon lieutenants, it's just not that simple. Demons, yes, but the Dreadlords are more. As a culture and society, the Nathrazim are best described as professional shitsters, with a natural talent for disrupting and destroying things from within. The Dreadlords are naturally duplicitous and said to be perfect spies. We also point out here that their lore as a species has undergone significant changes since Shadowlands. Originally just a race of demons known for being especially sneaky and high-ranking in the Burning Legion, it was revealed in the Afterlife expansion that the Dreadlords weren't demons at all, but psychic vampires created by Sire Denathrius and the Jailer as sleeper agents. And while we won't get into that too much because, well, Shadowlands was bad from a lore perspective. It also highlights that a Dreadlord's allegiances are never so simple. As it was with the case of Balnazar, the Dreadlord who came across Sidan Dathrahan in Stratholm, killed him and then proceeded to take over his body and pose as the Holy Paladin leader. Using humans' current distrust and loathing for anything unlike themselves, this Dreadlord began a new campaign to use the Silver Hand to his own ends while also protecting the interests of the Burning Legion and thus protecting the interests of Sargeras. And his first move was to get rid of his biggest threat at the time, the Ashbringer.
The Holy Weapon Ashbringer has a long and sordid history, both in lore and in the meta text of World of Warcraft. One of the first legendary weapons in the game, the Ashbringer sword as it was in WoW originally is no longer available for players to get. Which is a shame because it actually triggered a very interesting and cool event if you walked into the Scarlet Monastery dungeon with it equipped. Funny enough, it turns Scarlet Crusade members friendly. Originally dropped out of the first version of Nax Ramus from the Four Horsemen fight, this version of the legendary sword would be taken out of the game at the start of Wrath of the Lich King, once again vanishing from the game until reappearing in the Paladin Class Hall questline in the Legion expansion. However, the line from dropping off a hard boss to player character weapon involves numerous zigzags, retcons, and even a brief stint as a legendary weapon drop in Diablo 3. Formed from the aforementioned Dark Crystal off the body of an orc warlock, the Ashbringer was a Scarlet Crusade weapon of choice and the ace in the hole against the undead. Powered by holy energy emanating from the core of a cleansed Naru, the Ashbringer is arguably the most iconic weapon of Warcraft lore. Originally wielded by Alexandros Mograin, the sword presented a clear and present problem for the Dreadlord Balnazar, now wearing the meat suit of Holy Paladin Sidan Dathrahan. Alexandros represented a believer in a true and righteous cause, and if the demon was ever going to use the crusade for his own ends and the ends of the Legion, then he'd need to remove two birds with one stone. Enter Alexandros' son, Renault. The consummate Nepo baby son, unable to step into his father's shoes, Renault burned with resentment and jealousy towards his father. Even as a high-ranking commander himself in the Scarlet Crusade, Renault was viewed by his peers and contemporaries as just the son of the leader, which made him easy pickings for a plot hatched between Kel'Thuzad and Balnazar to remove not only the most threatening human left, but also the Ashbringer as well. The Dreadlord began speaking of corruption and distrust in the ears of the eldest Mograin son, even going as far as poisoning Renault with his own corrupted blood. And so, under the orders of the false paladin Sidan, the son led the father into a trap at Stratholm, with the wielder of the Ashbringer becoming overrun with scourge everywhere. And though he fended them off as best as he could, it would be Alexandros being stabbed through the heart with his own blade by his own son on the cold cobblestone of Stratholm that would seal the deal. This act corrupted the Ashbringer, turning it into the iconic and sickly green color that we see it as in Nax Ramus, and that's where the blade is taken. Renal is made the Grand Crusader of the Scarlet Crusade, and as his first act as leader kills the High Inquisitor Fairbanks who saw the entire betrayal go down, claiming he was tainted with the undead. This is why the body of Fairbanks is hidden as a secret boss in the final wing of Scarlet Monastery. And this creates the final schism between those in the Crusade who thought they were doing good and those corrupted by power. The paladins that left formed a new group, the Argenton. Meanwhile, Renault is now commander of the Scarlet Monastery and leads the campaign of war against all undead and the so-called lesser races that, according to the Scarlet Crusade, carry the taint. And this is basically where we find things at the start of Vanilla WoW. The Crusade holds parts of Stratholm, with Balnazar keeping up appearances, Renault is deep in Forsaken territory, and a second Mograine son is… somewhere. <laughs> this is actually one of those weird retcons, as in-game text in Classic says that Darien Mograine is initially in Outland. The Ashbringer comic changes this, however, and places Darien directly into the Argendon, and eventually walking into the Halls of Nax Ramus to take back the Ashbringer. However, that story, and that of Darien, is a different episode. At this point, it's all downhill from here for the Scarlet Crusade. Essentially a sleeper cell group working both against and for the Scourge, the Crusade is always just kind of around through the first three expansions, including showing up in a new form in Wrath of the Lich King, taking up the name of the Scarlet Onslaught. We talked about this a bit in the Death Knight episode, but this new version of the Crusade would be its last. 
Once Cataclysm came around, the story finally received an update. Baunazar was revealed to be hiding within their ranks, and just decides to kill the rest of the Scarlet Crusaders in Strathholm and raise them as mindless husks, foregoing the charade. And while there would be brief mentions of the Scarlet Crusade here and there, this is essentially where their story ends. So desperate to hang on to their so-called heritage, the elite humans of the Eastern Kingdoms ended up becoming undead slaves to the hatred that doomed them from the start. They could have been the Argentan, they could have easily taken back their homelands. Instead, they allowed propaganda, fear, and a slight case of demon infestation to doom them all. And I mentioned the weirdness of being able to wear transmogs of the Scarlet Crusade in-game earlier, and I think the first time I questioned it in an exegetical sense was when I was leveling a Blood Elf Pally for the first time back in Wrath. I had actually gotten the Scarlet Crusade Tabard and Shield, and found there to be some weird dissonance in decking out my pally in those colors. It reminded me of the Chappelle show skit about the black KKK member in a way. But I suppose this is also where the role-playing element of this MMORPG comes into play. If I want to play as a self-hating blood elf wearing the colors of an elite group, why not? It's an aspect of the game that is often missed, given that the framework for the player character is now that of a great champion for good that slayed gods, aliens, sentient weapons, dragons, and more. It used to be simpler. In the early days of WoW, you were just an adventurer, and with that came more freedom and ability to go in any direction. So honestly, I'm glad those transmogs are there. And as for the Scarlet Crusade, they represent a very specific time and place in the history of WoW, and are, dare I say, iconic. After all, what good is a hero without an equally bad villain? However, there are also lines. It's pretty well known at this point that real-world white supremacy groups are online, and in some cases run RP server guilds where they essentially cosplay the crusade, only allowing you to have white human characters. This is the thing with media that happens when attempting to show the evil of the real world, and it finds ways of manifesting and finding power through those representations, even if they're satire, parody, or showing historical context. Consider something like American History X, a piece of media showcasing the horrors of neo-Nazi movements, but also a film that those same movements have come to adopt in some forms because of its depictions of violence, going as far as groups adopting songs and sayings from the film, such as the racist tune of The White Man Marches On, and this is but one example throughout the history of media. And there really isn't anything to be done about that. Fringe groups will always find ways to see themselves in the mainstream and try to convince everybody else, and even people in their groups, that it's actually a cry from a silent majority, and that's all hogwash. In the end, those groups will always lose out over the common good, inclusion, equity, and people of every walk of life coming together in groups of 25 to 40 to take on a giant fire demon with a big hammer. As you do. And if we want to boil this down to talking about themes, the story of the Scarlet Crusade is the tale of forced family versus found family. This week's patch update gave us the new Forsaken Heritage Armor questline, and with it a ton of new information about the faction, including new dialogue from Sylvanas, and new dialogue between Kalia Menethil and former Scarlet Crusade leader Lillian Voss. Now I am all that remains of the once proud Menethil line. The last heir to a legacy that ended in shame. So you ran away from the pain. I did too. But it was only when I stopped running that I understood. Those people out there... They're my family now. But Lillian stands as an interesting piece of the Scarlet Crusade lore, as a former member of the Daughter of a Higher Up, on a similar road as Renault. It wasn't until her undeath that she was able to see the lie of homogeny for what it is, and that true family and belonging comes to those with common threads. It's here in the Forsaken Heritage Quest that we see Kalia and Lillian lead a final assault to purge the Scarlet Crusade, from Silverpine and Tiras Fall. But not for nothing, I don't regret torturing all those Scarlet Crusaders in the Death Knight starting zone. Sorry, not sorry. Next time on Essence of Azeroth, 
We've looked at the lore of races before, so join me on the next episode when we look at the origins of the Forsaken, their long road to finding a future, and where the faction is currently in the story. It's almost like it's a part two to this one. Weird. Take care.